way to tell us if it's other than I can hear. Thank you very much. I mean, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. yes. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Well, uh, effectively, today is the day of the vote. Well, we all know that the U.S. is going to veto, all right? But that's not the interesting part of it. The interesting part is how many states are going to vote. That's better. Thank you. How many uh, states are going to vote for the recognition of the Palestinian state? That's the real thing which is at stake. My own belief is that there will be uh, an overwhelming majority, uh, which, whatever happens, uh, is going to be a, a psychological and a political blow for the government and the coalition of Mr. Netanyahu. Let me uh, start by saying that there is no just solution of the Palestinian problem uh, in the sense that uh, it is not possible to, uh, to render justice to everyone. This from the very beginning has been a very complex issue. It will remain complex and you all know how it started. Uh, if we go back to the the end of the 19th century, we have uh, a small, let's say, uh, proportion, very small proportion of uh, people in uh, East Europe, mainly Russia and Poland, who left the country to go back to Sion, they uh, represented probably from the stream which left for political reasons essentially, because of pogroms and so on, and also because the West was a lot more democratic, they represented between 1880 and 1914 probably 2% of those which emigrated. In other words, the Zionist idea was certainly not, from the very beginning, something deeply popular. You had people who were going west, mainly to the US, but also to Britain, Germany, France. You had also people who were members of the Bund. The Bund was a lot more powerful than the Zionists. The Bund used to say that we're going to stay in the countries where we are and we're going to keep our culture. We, we are a diasporic people. Then you had also uh, the stream of those who were uh, either socialist or, and or Marxist, like Rosa Luxemburg and many, many others which were so important in the Bolshevik Revolution, especially, especially in the first years. In other words, uh, this starts as a slow stream and will be helped by World War I. Wars, by the way, I know it's not very popular these days to say that there, are, there is something good in war, but wars are a remarkable opportunity for change. War, for instance, World War II, World War II was a magnificent time for all those who were colonized while the Japanese were uh, victorious in 41, 42, it was a beautiful time to revolt, to organize. That's the case of the Viet Minh, that's the case of many other movements in Indonesia, etc., etc. So, World War I also was a time which helped change in many places. The British, and let's not forget that in 1914, the British are number one. Not economically, economically already uh, would be nice to stop uh, your telephone sign. I did stop mine. Uh, the British were the strongest, not economically, but politically. They were the imperial power by very far. And they played, uh, I would say, a threefold card. On one hand, uh, they said to the French, who were the number two, colonially speaking in those days, 
Well, if we win, and we are going to win, and prevail against the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, we'll split. Uh, you'll take uh, this, we'll take that. But I mean, there's one thing we was so sure, they were going to divide the, the Near East. I will show you the map of the division. Then, uh, the British at the same time were uh, helping since 1916 through one of their agents called uh, T.E. Lawrence, uh, an Arab revolt in Arabia by the Hashemites who wanted to get rid of the Turks. The Turks were not liked in those years. They are liked since a few years now. I will explain why. And um, the third thing is that uh, Mr. Weizmann was um, quite influential in Britain and also there was a, a Jewish uh, minority, uh, wealthy and cultivated, etc., etc., which had some weight in the US. They, they at the same time, I mean, one section at least of the foreign affairs said, uh, yeah, why don't we grant them uh, a sort of uh, a right to a homeland? That's what's happened with the Balfour Declaration, which in itself has a contradiction. It's supposed to be a homeland as long as that homeland does not contradict with the interest of the people who are uh, inside. But, I mean, if, if I was British in those days, I would say that I'm playing something with the French, something else with the Arabs, and something else with the Jews. So, that, that's the way it was. That's politics. The French and the British prevailed, so Palestine went to uh, the British, and this is the first map. Let me look to it. That's the map in 1923. Why did I choose 1923? Because uh, Turkey is uh, as it is now. Oh, sorry. Turkey has the same borders uh, as today, except that they will get this Sanjak of Alexander back in 1939. Let's speak briefly of Turkey. Turkey uh, was vanquished and the colonial powers wanted large chunk of it. Uh, the British were interested in the Straits as usual, the Italians in Antalya here, the Greeks, which were allies, wanted Smyr, Smyrna here because it was, their presence was 3,000 years old. Most of the names of the old Greeks, which have produced something interesting, comes from Ionia. Uh, the Armenians had normally, after the fact that they had been slaughtered, maybe 40% of them had been slaughtered by the Turks, because the Turks thought that if, if, if they lose, uh, the, the Russians would have them as allies. The, they had been granted by President Wilson a very large border that they were not demographically able to hell or hold for the very good reason that they had lost 40% or maybe more of their population. Uh, so <clears throat> the French wanted this point, which was called in those days Cilicia. Well, the, the Greeks were beaten, the Armenians which were here were repulsed. The French were sent back to Syria. They had not the, the stamina after the big losses of World War I to really uh, challenge the Kemalists. And the Kemalists, led by a, a man of genius, Mustafa Kemal, they were able to keep their own territory, Anatolia, Anatolia plus a chunk here of Europe with uh, Andridopolis, which is now a All right, so from the Treaty of Sèvres, which was a bad one for the Turks, they have a better one in Lausanne, Switzerland, 
and they are independent. They will be helped, by the way, by the Bolsheviks in those days, who felt that those guys were anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, etc. And uh, the, the Near East was divided. The French who were supposed to have uh, this part were said by the British, uh, why don't you take Syria instead? Uh, they knew there was a point here, which the French didn't know. So the French got Syria, they got Lebanon, and the British got uh, Palestine, Transjordan, Palestine uh, was exactly what is today Israel plus the West Bank. In other words, uh, the historical Palestine of the colonial period is what is Israel plus the West Bank. Transjordan was this, essentially with, with a little, little agriculture here, it was essentially deserted. Iraq was made by uh, two vilayets, which means uh, provinces, Basra and Baghdad, and the British wanted a third one, the vilayet of Mosul here, where 58% of the population was Kurdish, and they went for a revolt here in 1920, a revolt here with the, the Shia, and they backed, the British backed the Sunnis, which was uh, perfectly logical. Sunnis were 85% of the total of Muslim, so we should know that uh, they had always been in power, those Sunnis, during the mandate, during the royalty, during etc. etc. So let's go back now to uh, <coughs> this place from uh, 17 to, let's say, uh, the First World War in 45. I will be short because you know the story. Uh, there are going to be clashes between the Arab majority and the Jewish minority. Uh, in 1920, in 1929, there will be worse. In the 30s, 36, 39, there will be a real guerrilla war with the British troops somewhere in the middle. And there will be a slow stream of people between 1970 and 1933. There will be a lot more people after the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany. Between 33 and 39, you have a lot more people who would come. Nevertheless, there will still be a, a small minority compared to the Arab population. They were called Arabs. Nobody called them Palestinian in those days. This was Arab, Arab land. This, uh, for Syrians, for instance, was the greatest Syria. And um, the policy of the, U the, the UK was, we have uh, a lot of Arabs and a few Jews. So we should not lose the support of the Arabs. For us, it's very important. That's why, from one white book to another, uh, they were pretty harsh as far as uh, permitting to, uh, the Jews to uh, uh, emigrate. That went, of course, uh, very badly during uh, what has been called uh, by Lemkin the genocide. And, uh, the, after 1945, you have the Lehi and uh, the Stern Group who are going to be fighting against British presence. British, despite the fact that they had not far from 100,000 troops, decided that they're not going to sustain this uh, uh, irregular warfare which was based on terrorist attack led, among others, by uh, Anayim Begin. And they uh, said to the United Nations, OK, uh, the decision is yours. It should be said that Israel was recognized not only by the US, the British, the French, but also by the USSR. For the USSR, this country was supposed to be 
anti-imperialist because they were against the British. And the British were imperialist. So that's the choice. And we also must say that uh, the socialists in these days were quite strong inside uh, the state of Israel. They will change their policies uh, after 1949. The war is going to be bitter. The This is uh, Palestine in 46. The spots here are essentially the Jewish settlements. In other words, a lot in the coast. Here, not far from the lake. A bit in the Dead Sea, around Beersheba. This is the famous dividing plan in 47 by the United Nations. Uh, watch, watch well. In other words, the whole of the coast here. Here, a large chunk of desert. Here, Gaza, a greater Gaza. And this is entirely Arab plus Galilee. So in other words, uh, the Jews accepted. It's better than nothing. And Arabs, but not only the Arabs here, Arabs, because there was a sort of feeling of Arabism, Arabs, which means Egyptians, which means Iraq, which means uh, Transjordan. In fact, it's not yet Jordan, it's Transjordan. Syria, the four of them will refuse and they will enter into a war in 48. The, the war will be ultimately won by the Israelis who will manage uh, to uh, expel a certain uh, amount of uh, Arab population which amounts to uh, at least uh, 700,000 through incidents like the one which is well known. And uh, we have a, a non-peace because the existence of Israel is not accepted. They, the Arab states believed that they could get rid of uh, Israel. Wrongly. Mistake. Second thing, which is interesting to say, uh, Gaza was under the jurisdiction of Egypt, and the West Bank had been annexed by Transjordan. In fact, this was, these two things, Gaza and the West Bank, which today the Palestinians, at least the PLO, <coughs> admits that this is the aim of the creation of the state, uh, these two territories have been between 1949 and 1967 under the hands of the Arabs. That's a fact. It has not been given to the Palestinians for the very simple reason that they were not called Palestinians really in those days. They, we are in the era of what's going to become in 52 and more in 54, uh, Arabism, Pan-Arabism, Nasserism, and so on. Uh, many of the people which belonged in 65 and from 55, 59 on, uh, from 55 on, 59 on to uh, the Palestinian nationalist movement, Fatah, etc., had to hide. You were not supported by the, the Egyptians, you were not supported by the Syrians. Only up to a certain point you had some help from the Iraqis. You were not, of course, supported by Transjordan, Transjordania, and which was called now Jordan. In other words, uh, what brought Palestine on the forefront, at least 
or the West, at least for world public opinion in these days, was the overwhelming defeat that uh, the Arab states, all of them, whether it's Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and especially Egypt, would take in six days in June 67. Uh, the new map is changed, of course. Everything now is under the domination of Israel, including the Sinai. The Sinai will be exchanged against the recognition of Israel by the Egyptians, by Mr. Sadat, who for that very reason was shot by Islam, radical Islamists in 81. Radical Islam doesn't start with Mr. Bin Laden. Then we have whatever the government, a slow, de facto, Colonization, you might call it settlement, it doesn't change. You know, I, I had some uh, problems somewhere when I was uh, saying that there has been colonies. No, they say it's not colonies, it's settlement. Okay, that's playing on the word. The fact it, it's that it's Jewish implantation, Israeli implantations. So the fact is that it started from 67 on and it was accelerated once the Likud came into power, 77, and it was accelerated after that until <clears throat> there was an attempt of uh, making peace or in the 90s with Mr. Rabin, who for that very reason was assassinated by ultra-nationalist Jew. And uh, now we have had, for the first time, a year and a half ago, two years ago, a government of coalition with Mr. Netanyahu, who when they came into power said, uh, we're not interested in the Palestinian state. For the first time this was said. So why, why, and this is my subject, why, Why didn't the Palestinian did not prevail better? Uh, why didn't they uh, manage, for instance, to have this kind of uh, support from the United Nations, which they uh, sort of got when Yasser Arafat recognized Israel after 10 years of not recognizing it? Well, the first mistake of the Palestinians in uh, <coughs> 1967-68 was the idea that uh, we can beat Israel. I was there. Uh, I spent six months in 69-70 until uh, September 70 with the Palestinians, two months with Arafat, two months with Mr. Uh, Habash, two months with Mr. Nayef Hawatmeh, and uh, the general idea in the spirit of the day of those days, what was the spirit of the day of those days? It's uh, Cuba, Latino American uh, revolutions, Guevara, which was just there in 67. Uh, Vietnam is resisting uh, the US successfully. It's another world, right? So we can do it. We will make Hanoi. I heard that ten of times. We will make Hanoi in Palestine. That was, uh, besides, the idea was that the, the Israelis are not a people. They, they, are, they come from very different uh, cultures. Uh, they are the Ashkenaz, they are the Sephardic. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, they, they don't really like each other. They, they are together because they are against us, but in fact, uh, they cannot sustain peace. Well, all those preconceived idea or prejudices were wrong. The first thing is that, militarily speaking, it was not possible to prevail against Israel through guerrilla warfare. 
Why, why does guerrilla warfare today prevails against a democracy? Most of the time because public opinion, tired of losses, tired of the price of counterinsurgency, will say, bring the boys back home. Well, for Israelis, where is home? It's in Israel. I might, as a Palestinian, say that it's not your home, but he's an Israeli, and he considered that Israel is, is rightly his home. By the way, he won it. He won it through the, the challenge of truth. The challenge of truth is when we fight and I beat you. Right? They won it in 49. In other words, Israelis were not going to go elsewhere. They were there to help the country. There was no bring the, back, bring, bring the boys back home. So that makes the difference in the case of Israel. It makes a very important difference. Besides, never any of those groups, and there were six or seven of them at least, Never any of those groups had the capacity to really create the conditions of a guerrilla warfare inside Israel, inside the occupied territories. There were some commando operations. Many of them never came back. <clears throat> Second question. This was a, a very small people, three, three and a half million in those days. How many organizations, six or seven organizations, for a small people. Why? Why so many? Why Saika? Why Fatah? Why uh, Habash uh, Front of uh, libera Popular Liberation? Uh, of, uh, why Hawatme with the Democratic, etc.? Why uh, the Arab Front? Because most of them were supported by one Arab country or the other. The fact is that the Syrians were backing the Saika, the Iraqis were backing the Arab Front, the <clears throat> Fatah was receiving many of its money from Saudi Arabia, the Egyptians were part of the game, let's not forget that until uh, 79, 70, until his death, Nasser is still, still a, a, a man of prestige, and so on. So they were divided, they were divided, they were bickering, and uh, they also had a, a last problem, and that last problem is that they were in a country called Jordan. A country whose king had annexed the West Bank, whose country had a majority of at least 65% Palestinians, and we, 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 who were certainly not interested to see the Palestinian prevailed because it would have meant the fall of the Hashemite monarchy. All right? This is the real dimension. This is not just the business between Mr. Fatah and Mr. Arafat and, uh, and uh, the, the, the Israelis. It's a complex problem. It's an inter-Arab problem. It's a problem among Palestinians. It's a problem between the Israelis and the Arabs. It's a problem between the Palestinians and the Hashemites. That they, have, they never really faced openly, but which, which brought their downfall in September 70. In September 70, Mr. Habash made a big mistake. He hijacked some planes and brought them in Zarqa, in Jordan, and he started not consulting the king, of course, to discuss with the U.S. about uh, I'm going to uh, liberate those guys if and if, etc. Where is the state who can take that? There is no state who would agree that a group would negotiate with a foreign state without consulting it. So, Jordan, the king of Jordan decided that, okay, we're going to quit those guys. And the so-called uh, Fedayeen, who were uh, so proud of themselves because they had made the Battle of Karameh in 68, 
They had uh, one or two Israeli tanks that they were able to destroy. The king himself came and took a photograph on the tank. They thought that they made it. No. What they were? They were 15,000 people. Not well organized, not very well trained, not very well trained. And, 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 and the, the army of the Badawis, the Bedouins, were much better. Those guys were professional. The Transjordan army in 48, 49, was the best army which fought against the Israelis. They were still the best army in 67. So they collapsed. Besides, what brought? What brought into, uh, I would say, uh, to the high light the Palestinian problem? It's uh, the hijacking of an El Al plane in July 68 by the Popular Front of uh, Palestine, the movement of Mr. Habash. Suddenly it was everywhere in TVs, they made it, etc. So let me uh, tell you one thing. To make a spectacular action is certainly psychologically very important but it does not change the reality of the balance of forces. The most important thing which happened in the last 10 years is not 9-11. No, no. 9-11 in the history of uh, the 28th and the 21st century is a good, big footnote. That's what it is. What happened in the last 10 years, which is of importance, is the crisis, financial, and economic, which started in September 2008, and at the same time, it's that process of a change in the global equilibrium with the rise of the re-emergence, not the emergence. They were very emerged in the 18th century, in the in, in the 17th century. That's the comeback of the of the, the Chinese. It's the comeback of the Indians, etc and the relative decline of the West, which in 1945 was alone, and which in 1900 was more than alone, it was dominating the whole world. So that's the real important thing. The fact that I'm going to put a bomb is going to be all right, it's going to be in the TV, so what? So psychologically, it's very important. But I mean, the best definition of terrorism has been made by a Frenchman, sorry. Struck nationalism. But the guy said, he's called, he's called Raymond Aron, he said, uh, you can call, uh, can be called a uh, terrorist an action whose psychological impact is much more important than its physical effect, physical results. The physical results of most of uh, terrorist action is, is limited. Even the 3,000, which were a big blow, is limited compared to the fantastic psychological impact. Otherwise, we will not have 10 years later, again and again and again. You know how many people died in the last 10 years? In conflict, if we include Africa? Maybe 3 million? Well, who mentions those 3 million? No, those 3,000 are more important, all right? So let's not forget that what you sell in the media has an impact. But is the impact the only thing or is uh, the change of status quo more important? Terrorism has not changed the status quo in the world. It can be a uh, very costly reasons. Uh, as a guy told me, uh, yeah, it has changed our lives because when we take uh, uh, we go in the airport, we lose a lot of time. I said, yeah, but I mean, the rise of uh, the reemergence and the crisis of the euro and might change not your, your, your relationship with your airport. It might change your way of life, my dear friend. Okay, so let's measure what's important and what is just uh, secondary. Now, let's go back now to uh, the Palestinians. The movement was never united. Worse, uh, even when uh, Arafat managed to have a sort of, uh, I would say, uh, unity of most of the movements, you have had the creation of uh, Hamas, which incidentally has been at the beginning helped by the Israeli services, 
and then became, of course, uh, totally independent and very hostile. And Hamas is a movement which does not recognize Israel. Is that smart? Point of interrogation? I think it's stupid. I mean, why shouldn't that recognize that you are facing me? How, how can you consider that I'm not on this side of the desk? Well, what are you going to exactly negotiate? You're going to negotiate the fact that you agree that I exist? Am I interested in, in, in being uh, recognized by you who are not strong enough to challenge me? So in other words, I think that this division has been for the Israelis a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful gift to have Hamas. You can always say that you're not going to make peace with guys who are not even willing to recognize you. That's what I hear all the time uh, among uh, my Israeli uh, friends who are uh, pro, uh, pro Netanyahu. Fortunately, I have some who prefer Tzipi Levni. But uh, the fact is that Hamas has been extremely uh, useful for uh, Israel not to agree to go to a real negotiations. We might say that despite the efforts of Mr. Carter, despite the efforts of Mr. Clinton, despite the willingness uh, Mr. Obama, all in all, in, his, in Israel itself, there has never been, uh, except during Rabin, an absolute willingness to try to find a solution. And in Hamas, there has not been the expression that, okay, we might compromise. We agree that uh, a compromise is the only way to solve this problem. There is no just solution. It, there will never be a return of those who have been expelled in 48-49. Uh, uh, there are a lot of things which have to be discussed. And besides, between the strong and the weak, it's not the weak who is going to prevail easily. That's the way it is. Now, let's see what's the process of occupation. Well, that's the United Nations who made this map. I prefer this one. Well, <clears throat> in red, in red, you can see uh, what is uh, the settlements. You see that uh, those settlements are pretty important. Which, by the way, goes. You see, this is the border. Right? Let me remind you that the whole thing is a small place. Huh? We should also remember that it is a small place. Uh, the West Bank is 5,500 square kilometers. So, what uh, is controlled today by the the Israelis is a good 20%. Besides, there are roads here which are absolutely under the control of the Israelis alone that Palestinians cannot use. We see that Jerusalem is a lot bigger than what it was and that the east goes very much east now. And that we have a lot of checkpoints, was where some of the checkpoints, and this was the project of the Greater Jerusalem. Oh, sorry. Greater Jerusalem is not far from Jericho, which is very near the border. So in other words, this is really a serious policy of uh, annexation of the facto. The idea of the Palestinian state is that there might be some swaps. In other words, uh, probably, probably these places are going to remain Palestine, um, Israeli. And in exchange, they will get some 
some places, I don't know where exactly, maybe here down, maybe up here up. Uh, the, the real difficulty would be in Jerusalem. I, I believe that for the Israelis, Jerusalem is non negotiable. That's my it's not my point of view, it's what I hear, it's what I I fear, it's, it's perception. So we are in a sort of a dead end. And a dead end that has been, uh, in, in other words, uh, not eased by U.S. policy. Uh, we could question, is it smart for the U.S. <clears throat> to back any government, whatever their policy, any Israeli government, whatever their policy, or should they back any government who is willing to find a solution to the Palestinian problem so that it will not jeopardize the interest of the U.S. in the Muslim world. For a long time, this was not felt as important because the U.S. was sort of omnipotent. The U.S after the fall of the USSR, felt a sort of extraordinary feeling of uh, we are unbeatable, there are no number two, three, four, five, so we can do whatever you, we want, and the idea in 2003 was we finish an unfinished war, we go to Iraq, we will uh, remodel the greater Middle East, this will have our Israeli friends, that's what the neocon said. Then I heard also Volkovich saying that the road to uh, the road to uh, Tel Aviv uh, passes through Baghdad, which means that uh, it will ease the policy of the Israelis if we go first to uh, Iraq and then we will twist the arm of the Syrians so that they will help, they will stop helping. Uh, Hezbollah and Hamas and so on. Well, the fact is that things have changed since. Things have changed, and I would say that one of the signs of that change is the new importance of the re-emergence. And among them, regionally of Turkey. That's a new phenomenon which started in 2008, if I remember okay, or 10, I don't remember. When was Mavi Marbara? 10? 10. 10, okay. 10. Mavi Marbara is, uh, is an attempt to go to Gaza, which was under uh, embargo. There was a war here, there was a war up north also against Hezbollah, I, I will answer the questions if there are, and uh, the, uh, the embargo wanted to be broken by the Turks. The idea of the Turks <coughs> was that we are building a strong economy, we should now uh, a diplomacy which is really highly dynamic, they have a very smart uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, we, have, we want no enemy around us, the best possible relationship with whoever, but at the same time, for a certain number of years, Turkey had been a close ally of the Israelis. Uh, I would say that Israel, Jordan and Turkey were doing joint military operations, trading. That's finished. Uh, the, the, the Turks understood that if they wanted to be number one in the Middle East, they have to oppose to the Israelis to a certain extent. It doesn't mean breaking relations. It means to show that you don't agree. For instance, Mr. Uh, Erdogan, he said, uh, the recognition of uh, the Palestinian state is not a choice for us, it's an obligation. He said also, 
Israel is the spoiled child of the West. So this is measured. This is not insulting, uh, but it shows very well that, uh, well, the, the Turks have changed. The Turks are leading the, the Middle East. Uh, Turks, which were absolutely unpopular five years ago in the Middle East, are now acclaimed uh, in uh, Lebanon. They go to Egypt. Uh, they are uh, the number one. And uh, this, this isolates Israel, who has uh, in the area, who is the ally of the Israelis. Jordan is not going to say that uh, they, they, uh, they are backing Israel. Jordan <coughs> shuts up. They shut up. Because uh, the more discreet you are, the better it is. Uh, Turkey has changed. Uh, those uh, Arab insurrections are not particularly uh, keen to agree that the Palestinian problem should not be solved. On the contrary, Egyptians and others would like the, the Israeli uh, to withdraw from uh, the West Bank. They want to uh, have a Palestinian state. The, Palestinian, the problem of the Palestinian state is no more a, a regional problem. It, it has become a real problem in international relations. And that's, that's, that's bad for the coalition of Mr. Netanyahu. I'm saying that because the coalition of Mr. Netanyahu is not everything in Israel. Uh, normally, Sipi Levni had more voice than Netanyahu. Simply, the coalition that she wanted to, to create uh, had not the backing of the, the religious, which were much more interested to back Mr. Netanyahu because the religious are ultra-nationalist. And they have also Mr. Avigor Lieberman, who just said when he became, uh, before even he became uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, he said, why don't we expel all the Palestinians from uh, the West Bank? So this is uh, the kind of uh, context in which we are. And, and I believe that uh, psychologically, and maybe politically, the fact that there will be an overwhelming majority of states who will uh, uh, back the existence of the Palestinian state might help. This doesn't mean that the Palestinian state will be created. I think that the present government will uh, wait and see. I think that they will wait for uh, the Republicans to come back into power. Uh, they, uh, as long as they are backed by the U.S., they can still do more or less, even if it's very popular, what they want. That will be my, my conclusion. So we go for a round of questions and answers. I'm at your disposal. Uh, feel free to recognize your name. Yes, sir. Questions. Yes. Uh, my name is Mr. Palidia. Uh, I'm a Singaporean Arab of Yemeni origin. I just want to have correct one historical uh, mistake you have after just now. Yes, that, with pleasure. That, that uh, Hamas did not recognize Israel. Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, the so-called radical leader who was dead the assassinated by, by the Jewish Secret Service, has recognized the 1967 borders on record, and the Jerusalem, East Jerusalem being the capital for the Arabs and the West Jerusalem capital for the Israelis. This is on record. He has recognized the 1967 borders. And going back to the other negotiations, Israel has always dug its head in the sand. This plucky little state has uh, managed to manipulate uh, world view from the days of uh, the, the conference in Spain, Oslo, right up to uh, 242 and all that, the world doesn't seem to react. The world has turned its back on, 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 on the Palestinian plan. You mentioned earlier in the introduction that the mandate, the British mandate, uh, which resulted in the doubtful declaration, allowed the Jews to have a home and not a state. That is a real uh, step in the back to the Arabs when 
when they connive with, with the Jews. And in, in fact, uh, why the Israelis is not popular, the Turkish not popular, the Turks? Because the Turks recognized Israel, the first Muslim country in the world to recognize Israel in 1949. That's on record. Uh, now the scenario is changing. And, and the Turkish state of Israel is not realizing the changes, the Arab revolution. The, the, the map that you see now will not be the same in the previous time. And I think uh, the sooner the, the little plucky state is where realizes this, and, and they have to uh, uh, bend a little bit and negotiate. Otherwise, there will be no more. Uh, the Arabs will say, we want this one Palestine, <laughs> not Israel anymore. Uh, and regarding, um, the, the, you said Hamas, Hamas was stupid. Well, Hamas, um, partnered with uh, Hezbollah in the last war, they proved to be more effective than all the Arab states in 1967. And, and in fact, the Israeli, uh, the so-called ISD, Israeli Defense Force, uh, um, the, the many uh, uh, soldiers even refused to fight the war in, in Lebanon and Gaza because of, of the brutalities of certain uh, atrocities committed. So the, the, the point I want to make here is that uh, the situation in the Middle East is evolving. And, and uh, the old problems cannot be solved by the old methods. Yes, okay. So now the bid to the United Nations is to isolate the hegemony of USA and Israel in the eyes of the world and in, in, in the Middle East. The, whether so far, even before going, 137 countries have already given uh, recognition to Israel. 127 countries, de facto recognition. And this, the, if we put the vote, it will be overwhelming now. The point is that the Middle East is turning away from Western hegemony, American hegemony, and which you uh, very eloquently pointed out in the beginning of your, of your lecture, that the, after World War II, they divided the whole Middle East into various colonies and all that. So the scenario is changing. And okay. in, fact, in fact, now lately, Cameron and, 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 and Sarkozy are moving slowly from the American uh, standpoint. Uh, they feel embarrassed because they want to identify <coughs> themselves with the new revolution. May, may I have your comments? Okay, you made your point. I, I, I think I conveyed the idea that the world is changing. Yeah. I think I conveyed the idea that there is a change with the reemergence. I think I conveyed that the U.S. is not as omnipotent as it used to be, yes. which doesn't mean that they are going to disappear, that they are going to be weak. They still are, militarily speaking, the number ones. And uh, to take back what you said on, on uh, Sheikh Yassin, who yeah. effectively was assassinated, yes, he said that, but officially Hamas today does not recognize Israel. That's my point. So you can... And Israel has recognized the, ele the election to take place in Gaza also. Okay, of course. <laughs> yeah, we call that the statement. <laughs> You don't, you don't recognize yeah, the election? Election. Okay. All right. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your uh, the facts on the ground presentation very much. I have a little difficulty with some of the ways you formulate your frame. For example, ultra-nationalist uh, Jew, you call them. But on the other hand, you call fundamentalist Arab. So that, I guess, somewhat challenges the objectivity of the presentation, but I enjoyed very much. My question now is that in the end of your, you ended your presentation by saying that Israelis will wait for a Republican government, so wait and see. And that is in a kind of contradiction or tension with your general assessment that new emerging powers are uh, shadowing, let's say. U.S. power, and you spend lots of time in Turkey. You started with Turkey and transformation. No, I see so that if that's the case, and I know there are a couple of my colleagues here, they are looking at new alliances that Israeli might pursue. I don't want to get into that. Okay. That's their 
work. But I just want to see how, yes. how you bring these two. So together. as far as calling uh, one Israeli and the other Arabs, uh, I said that for a long time they were called Arabs and from 67 on they were called Palestinians. Uh, there is no mention of Palestinian Arabs as such in uh, 1917 for the very simple reason that they were Arabs. Before that, they were all Muslims in the, in the framework of the Ummah. Let's not invent uh, an old nationalism which did not exist. But my point was one is ultra-nationalist Jew, which has this positive sense of, you know, honor and history. The other one is fundamentalist Arab in your evaluation, not Palestinian. If these are too extremes and too negative, probably they need to be framed in the no, same I, way. I, I don't think that uh, Hamas uh, is uh, more fundamentalist than it is, than it is nationalist. I think that they are essentially nationalist. Hamas is above all nationalist. That's why they have never collaborated with mainstream uh, radical Islamism <coughs> for uh, join Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda. They are Palestinians. Now, uh, what I said about the Republicans, well, up to, up to today, I'm talking about what I know. Uh, that when I say they would prefer the Republicans, uh, this is the future. I know that Mr. Netanyahu would rather have someone else than Mr. Obama. He would really prefer Mr. Gingrich or who, well, whatever Republican, because the Republican will back his policy, and Mr. Obama is criticizing. So they are isolated, like they have, I believe, never been. Uh, but let's not forget that they are still military number one, and that they have the nuclear bomb. And they are, they are not going to uh, easily uh, change as long as the U.S. is going to back them and to, by the veto, the U.S. is backing them. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu went to Congress. He had long-standing ovation because Congress believes that uh, you've got to uh, back Israel whatever they do, which I believe is not uh, interest of the U.S. because you, uh, in other words, you antagonize a large part of the Muslim world, and not only of the Muslim world, but of all those who think that, that uh, Palestinians should have a state just by sheer uh, justice. Why, why, why free Tibet and not Palestine? Okay? Tell me. Why do I have a bumper sticker saying free Palestine? Free, free, free Tibet and not Palestine. That's it. Who else? Yes, Mr. Hudson. I would like to um, ask you a, a question that draws on your uh, interesting historical experience dealing with resistance movements. Um, you were one of the first people to write about the Palestinian resistance movement when it came into public notice in the uh, mid-1960s. And since then, you have been embedded with Kurds, Afghans, Viet Cong, and so on and so on. So you have got a pretty good ground knowledge of liberation movements and how resistance is carried out against overwhelming forces of the state and the international community. Uh, against that background, I'd be interested in your, in your evaluation of the Palestinian resistance movement, uh, uh, with particular attention to period, say, from the 60s up until the beginning of the Oslo process. And I'd be curious if you had any comments uh, about Arafat's leadership or about the nature of the Palestinian uh, resistance organizations compared to other resistance organizations that you've studied. Okay. Uh, that's a difficult exercise, but it's an interesting one. Uh, Palestinians are certainly not uh, the most efficient movement that I have met. Uh, as far as efficiency is concerned, I'm not speaking about the fact that it's just or not just, that it's morally okay. Huh? I'm speaking about techniques. I think that 
efficiency, efficient, if you speak of efficiency, the best I've ever met are the Vietnamese. I believe that the EPLF of uh, Eritrea was a very efficient movement, militarily speaking. They prevailed. They, they are independent. I think that despite the fact that they have been beaten, despite the fact that they were quite, let's say, harsh, the Tamil Tigers were a remarkably organized movement. And compared to those three, the Palestinians have been less good, especially at the very beginning in the 70s. In the 70s, they had the illusion that things would be easy, etc. But they are learned. Uh, for instance, uh, Hezbollah, I know it's not Palestinian, but I mean, we are in the area. Hezbollah in 2005 uh, was able to sustain uh, the Israeli intervention. Uh, Hezbollah killed about uh, 225 Israelis. 225 Israelis to you can seem not much, but for a country of uh, 6 million, that means what? If you make, if there are 6 million in, in Israel and 300 million in the US, that means that the US would have lost more or less 6,000 men in six weeks. That means that the U.S. would have lost 6,000 men in six weeks. So that's, that's a very good result. And they were not crushed. They were badly hit, but not crushed. Same thing with Hamas. Well, 1,000, 1,100 people were killed. But essentially, uh, Israel tried to destroy, not to kill people. They were not interested in they would have killed 15,000 if they wanted. No, they, were, they were willing to break the infrastructure, the so-called uh, buildings, whatever works, etc., etc., so that it, it ruins the economic possibility. Well, the answer is that Hamas was well organized enough to sustain the losses and to be able through the tunnels to still survive. The idea that you need tunnels to resist the bombing of the Israelis, it's something that I said, for instance, to the Palestinians in 69. I said, you, you need to, to have tunnels, you, you need to be, to be able to hide. You, you, this is a rugged terrain. It, there, are, there are no trees. There's no place to hide. So I said, the Vietnamese, they dig. They dig. They have kilometers. Oh, they say that's too much work. We'll just fight. That's it. See? It's kind of macho, stupid reaction. Now they have learned. They have learned that against somebody who is stronger, you've got to be smarter. You've got to be shrewd. You've got to be, uh, you've got to adapt. So I think that the Palestinians are much better now, like people of Hamas and so on. What went wrong? The division, the division, B, frankly, the corruption. I mean, no movement in the world, no movement of national liberation in the world has received as much money as the Palestinians. There have been enormous money poured by the Gulf, by the Saudis, and so on. And many of it has been uh, pocketed by some. That's one of the weaknesses also. There has never been that kind of uh, tight control which makes that during the fight at least you're not corrupted. After, after you seize power, it's different. And uh, there has been a certain mediocrity in the, in, in, in the leadership. You, you have a few smart guys. Many of them have been assassinated by the Mossad, by the way. Those that I knew in 69, very few have survived. Most of them violent death. Some of them have been killed in Beirut. Some others have been killed in the West Bank. Some others have been killed uh, elsewhere by commandos. Uh, in other words, uh, it has been very harsh. 
against their elites. And you know that when you kill the elites, you kill a lot more than one people. Uh, kill, killing the elites of a movement which has, uh, what, a few hundred really good men uh, uh, of international stat stature is, is very important. So all in all, the Palestinians have had a lot of problems, but they, they are better now than they, they used to be. Yes. I mean, you decide which one. <laughs> okay, you go. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, uh, first I just want to say it was, it was a really interesting talk. In fact, it was so interesting that I was craving for more. Um, the one area in which I, I was hoping you would have touched upon a lot more, but maybe you can now, would be the implications of this Palestinian, Palestinian statehood initiative. Um, you know, although my views are not really terribly important here, um, you know, on balance I do favor the uh, statehood initiative for a wide variety of reasons. Perhaps I think it's sort of the right thing that's being done for the wrong reasons. I think it's probably doing, uh, being pursued more likely just to salvage, you know, a boss and his legitimacy than any for any other reason. But despite that, I think it's the right course of action to follow. But playing devil's advocate with myself here, um, one, there are many unintended consequences, perhaps, of this uh, statehood move. And um, one of the, you know, the most negative consequences I can identify is sort of the whole Pyrrhic victory scenario. That the Palestinians go ahead and they attain recognition from the UN of an independent state, but then the next day, the occupation is still in effect. There's no end in sight and they can't establish meaningful control over the territory that they supp supposedly liberated from the UN. So my question is, do you fear that scenario as well? And uh, if so, what can be done to, to mitigate that or to you know, avert those consequences? Well, or what can the Palestinians do to raising, give this symbolic victory practical effect? You're raising a very important question. In fact, what will be the impact of the vote of the majority saying that we recognize this state which will not be recognized by those who should recognize it, in other words, by the Israelis, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, we change uh, the political sort of ambiance around Israel which makes that that state is, will be more isolated this evening than it was yesterday. But it will not change Mr. Netanyahu. In other words, we will not head to the creation of the state as long as the U.S. is going to back them. Nobody has got the strength to impose upon the Israelis a state, which will be called Palestinian, but the U.S. In other words, we are not sure in the short term, or maybe even in the next five to ten years, we are not sure that there will be a Palestinian state. Nobody can say with absolute certitude we are heading to a Palestinian state 100% sure. No. I, I, I still believe that this coalition does not want the creation of Palestinian state and will pursue its colonization as much as possible. That's it. Yes? Thank you. Uh, I would like to suspend morality in our discussion. I Temporarily. Know time. Yes. Temporarily. Uh, I know that's very difficult because we frame this in terms of justice. And, uh, what is, what is the right thing to do. Um, but you bring us to a very different perspective, which is uh, the hard fact of the imbalance of force and its consequences in terms of political outcomes. And I think uh, you have a, 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 a very powerful uh, opening in talking about the benefits of war in terms of their of the possible creating conditions that are conducive for revolution. And I would go on from that and suggest that revolutions can create conditions conducive for war, and revolutions can, can, can create conditions 
conditions conducive for other relationships. And that there are multiple chain reaction possibilities here, which create the, poss the, the which create the, the, the possibility for things that previously were unthinkable. Yeah, I agree. And I think that if I understand you correctly, uh, we are now approaching <coughs> more closely those conditions yes. than we ever have before. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, you haven't really sort of taken that seriously and addressed that. The other thing is, I'm very impressed by your notion that uh, Israel won the challenge of truth by fighting and bleeding and dying for the land. Um, and I think that that is the, uh, the, 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 the core of your argument, just once for everything, that you, that, that you told us. I think you're telling us basically that Israel was created by force, by people who uh, were willing to risk everything for the land, and that that has been missing on the other side. The people on the other side have not been willing to bleed enough to force their enemies to bleed more. And until they force their enemies to bleed more, they'll get nowhere. And they can't force their enemies to bleed more unless they bleed themselves. And if I may continue, that the problem with the Palestinian resistance is that it hasn't bled enough. It hasn't been efficient in the use of this silence, this desire to fight to the end for the land. And of course you say, what distinguishes the Israelis from the Americans is that they can't bring the boys home. But of course they do bring the boys home. They brought them home from Gaza. They brought them home from Lebanon, and they can bring them back from anywhere they want. And bring them home simply means getting them out. It doesn't just mean you know physically moving them uh, over the green line, but it also means getting them out of uniform and getting them back into productive, productive life. So uh, I guess you know my question basically is: Would you argue? Um, that the only way that a Palestinian state would be created is not through diplomacy or international pressure or these marginal shifts and balance of power internationally and locally, but only through an existential threat to Israeli nationhood which can only come about by the more efficient and determined use of force on the part of Palestinians themselves, and nobody's going to fight for them. Now, this is a, you know, I'm not advocating this, mm -hmm. um, but what is it? <laughs> okay, first of all, I, I understand your language. And I share it. I mean, to me, uh, when I try to make uh, the analysis of the situation, I don't speak about morality. I speak about what's the balance of forces. And morally, you can choose whatever you want, or it's your interest, or whatever your sympathies. That's not of my business. I'm here to explain. So I agree with you entirely uh, on one fact. Israel was created pretty late as a state and the process of colonial, the colonial process in which they are has been very late compared to the process that Britain and France have known in the 19th century. In other words, this changing world these days with the reemergence makes it that it's starting to be late. It is starting to be late. That's one. B, uh, it may become costly for the US to be unilaterally helping the policy of Israel, whatever that policy is. For instance, 
the fact that the Saudis, through Mr. Turkey, has said that if there is a veto, this might change very severely the kind of relationship that the, the Saudis can have. Well, it's not only a pure threat. It might be more than that. So in other words, if it really costs more to the U.S. economy to uh, back Israel blindly, it might be reconsidered. That's one. B, I agree also that the Palestinians could have done a lot more than playing guerrillas. That has not been enough. They did not, from the very beginning, organize for a long war. They did not took it seriously enough. They were, in other words, uh, stupidly, uh, I would say, brainwashed by their own propaganda and by the propaganda of vanquished Arab states who were very happy to see guys with Kalashnikov. But it's not because they tell you you're good, you're good, you're good, that you're good. So all of that has not been taken seriously. Uh, Hamas started because they were cornered. When you're cornered, yeah. either you disappear or you're good. Right. It's very important to be cornered. So, uh, I believe, yeah, that, of course, a certain level of violence is what changes uh, the course of history. Of course. Of course it does. Of course. I mean, the total pacifist is just a dreamer. I like peace. I'm not a pacifist. So, I think that, yeah, I agree with you. They have not been good enough. They might be obliged to become better. And there is also the backing of all the lies which might start to change. Turkey doesn't back that anymore. Saudi Arabia is very important. Well, maybe maybe Jordan might crumble one day. No, what about Jordan? You know, those guys are very discreet. He wants to be the king. But I mean he represents what? He represents the backing of the US plus 25% of the population, plus his own army, plus his own Cherkes. That's what the core is that. But if if the Palestinians, you know what? We we speak about so-called <coughs> revolution. You know, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, Yemen, etc. What is the damn price? paid by the Palestinians in Jordan. Did they go in the street? Did they face the Bedouins? Did they say something against the tribes? Did one die? Why should they? Why should they go? Why, why, should, why they go? should they? It's not their land, it's not their cause, it's not their issue. Why should they? Well, well, they are expelled. Those guys are no, Palestinians. No, it's not their fight. There, there are priorities. Okay. They are Palestinians. Do you remember the Black September when they were massacred? Yeah, they were massacred. Yeah, they went out of the streets. Why should they? They protested. Yeah, and of they course they should. And the world stood still. Yes. First, uh, first of all, I would say that I really abhor the idea that power gives legitimacy or gives justice or gives any cause, any credibility. Power is power, is naked power. There, is, there are other morality. We are a human being because we are moral and we are not tigers or animals killing each other. And therefore, I think there is a human civilization, a human culture, a human dignity, which is beyond power. This is the, the first point. The other point, what I would say that your presentation is a, pre is a presentation of, which was given through the imperial power, the Western power viewpoint. And I'll just give a few facts. The Palestinians did not fight in 48, not because they didn't want to fight or they were uh, coward to fight, but before in 37, 39, the British crushed them. The first time the British used airplane to bomb cities was in Palestine. 10% of the Palestinian adult population was killed in, by 37, 39. When they came to war, they didn't have any leadership, political or other, or, or military or other. And there was a Palestinian nation uh, uh, already in the in the beginning of the 90s. There, there were uh, there were demonstrations by even women Palestinian movements. 
So I don't know where, where are your, the, the, the things that you said as a Palestinian woman, I can tell you that it doesn't have any relation to what we learned from our parents and from our grandparents and from, from also the books that people, simple people with morals, not of power, wrote about their experience. So I don't know where, where you bring the, your things from. Okay, the other thing is that you present the conflict as conflict between Israelis and Arabs. It is not. I, I just wanted to tell you that your country, sir, built a small factory in Dimona for the Israelis. And Israel is bullying others with the products of this small factory, which in Dimona. And there are, uh, the Israelis want to kill Palestinian uh, uh, commanders and Palestinian leaders not before, before, because the Mossad was very powerful, but also because the collusion of the security, the security services of your country, of Britain, and others. The Israel won the 67 war not because of Israel, not only because of Israel's uh, willing to courage fight. or willing to fight, <laughs> but because of. I will tell you one thing: that in 48, Israel has more manpower, military trained manpower and weapons more than all the Arab armies together. And Britain threatened all Arab countries not to invade uh, the place that on which Israel was supposed to exist according to 48, 47 border. And the, Arab the, Arab, the Jordanians were led by a British colonel. And to say that there were Arabs, there were Israelis, they were fighting, this is a kind of Western... Western this is worse than the narrative of the, of the Zionist Jewish. It's worse than what I learned in, uh, in history, in Israel. What, what you are uh, bringing here, it's a narrative that I don't know where, where it is from. Even in Israel, they don't accept it. Well, first of all, I do not represent my country. Second, I try to be as, uh, I would say, uh, Objective as possible. We may disagree. This is not objectiveness. Now, if you believe that the Palestinians from 1920 were that mobilized, why? Why didn't they prevail? Why did when they were 80 percent? He already population? told you. I told you that the, the most sustained revolution in the Middle East, anti-colonial revolution in the Middle East and in the Third World, was in Palestine, 37-39. Three years, again, they stood against the British army, and the British used artillery against cities. They destroyed cities with heavy artillery and airplanes. Okay, that I agree. They have done that. Well, uh, the they, Palestinians they, are not only uh, facing Israel; they are facing all Europe. Exactly the the, the, the French uh, uh, the thing that you you you, you mentioned the uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, force of Israel power. It, it is a, a European, uh, uh, right. okay? So it's not uh, Arabs and Palestinians in front of Israel. It's, it's Palestinians in front of all Europe backing Israel and, is, and the America and the States. Okay. It's very different. Yeah, so, so, I mean, do you agree that there has been some mistake among uh, Palestinians elites? There is always mistakes. The, the, the question here is not the mistakes of the, the elites of the Palestinians. There were mistakes. And in every country, when there, are, when there is war, people would leave. In Israel, in to, to, uh, 2006, in Haifa, we live in Haifa, the, 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 uh, uh, the mayor of Haifa was telling the people to leave the country. And who didn't leave? Do you know who? The Arabs, the Palestinians. They didn't leave. They said, no, we won't leave. And he was telling the people to leave Haifa because they knew that, uh, that uh, uh, they, they believed what Nasrallah was threatening to, to arrive at Haifa. So it's in every country, the people who have the, the capacity to leave during the war, they will leave. And in every country, and I understand that according to the UN, people after the war have the right to come back to, come back to, their, to their cities. The only place that uh, people are, uh, were not allowed and uh, 62 years after they are still not allowed are the Palestinians. My, the, I, I have also parents and he has, everybody in Palestine, in Israel, Palestinian Arabs, have somebody who, who had left and couldn't uh, come back, only because he was a Palestinian. And it's, it's regular that people leave during the war. So let me ask you just one question. So 
So in other words, you, you think that they should be able to go back. <coughs> they should be able to go back, and all the time, the morality uh, uh, factor that you don't, uh, you don't accept uh, does not, uh, is not a factor in the negotiation for peace, there will not be peace. I, I, I disagree with you with the, 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 the argument about the factor of power. I think the factor of morality. Because all the time that are, there are people who are not given refugees, who are not given the, the chance to, to decide to come back or not, there won't be. And I, I tell you this as a Palestinian uh, who, who have lived uh, uh, through all these years and have uh, uh, heard the, the stories of, uh, of the people, of our parents. And uh, I think the, new gener the younger generation also believe that. It's not, a, a, it's, powers are, uh, are powers. But also there are the people who, who have uh, the, the motivation. And we shouldn't, uh, I, I don't want to kill anybody. And I don't want to be killed. And I don't want my child to go to, to be killed. And if I was an Israeli and a, a Jewish, I work with Israeli and Jewish. And I tell them in the face, I don't understand how a mother uh, 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 cho cho chose to, 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 to send her child to be a soldier. I don't want. I wouldn't. And uh, that's, it's, uh, there is uh, other uh, uh, things than power. There are uh, human uh, beings that want to live. We are not in the world of politics now. Uh, if you, don't you are saying that the Palestinians didn't want enough to, to bleed. Why should they bleed? You can choose to live. Excuse me, actually, I said that. OK, sorry. Yeah. You can yell at me too. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I, I used to. Okay, I was uh, a bit. Uh, I, I believe. I believe. Uh, no, this talk was very difficult for me, actually. No, I understand. I'm it's sorry. Emotions, but no, it's uh, more, more than emotions. Uh, uh, facts. Justice, justice is not exactly what happens in history. History is full of people who have been vanquished and never got what they lost. Never got what they lost. This is not justice. The fact that you have a just cause is not enough to get to get what you want. That's so is this said by an oppressor. So is this said by an oppressor. So easily said by an oppressor. There are oppressed people who understand that they will never make it. That's it. Some people have been beaten and they will never make it. I can I can give you examples. I can give you examples in the Middle East. Yeah? What, what happened to the Armenians in Turkey? They have been uh, exterminated. They out. Will they ever go back? Never. Why not? They must. No, they haven't got the strength. That's it. There is no justice in this business. So you've got to understand that. And uh, why, why shouldn't they, why should they uh, uh, be peacefully in, in Jordan, where, where, in fact, they are a majority? Why shouldn't take, why shouldn't have, why, why shouldn't It's not their country. Huh? It's not the country. It's the country of whom? If the country, if the, if a country is the, the country of the majority of the people who populate it, Jordan could be Palestinian also. It could also be uh, part of Palestine. This is a Zionist narrative. If, 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 if the world believes the doctrine of faith complete, uh, uh, they didn't know that it would prevail. Let me tell you one thing. You will no, never no. arrive at anything mind. with uniquely emotion and morality. This is a business of uh, force. This is a business of diplomacy. This is a business which is tough. And, and it's not only by emotions. I can perfectly suggest, suggest that, that Palestinians, emotion, but I mean, when you suggest that Palestinians living in Jordan as sojourners, develop a mentality to take over the land and fight Hashima, what, what do you expect us to think? That's your narrative, that's your suggestion. So I'm they mirror, the, I just, I just they mirror the Israelis. I just say that nobody in Jordan did move against the, the Hashemite monarchy despite the fact that it's full of Palestinians. That's a fact. Yes. And, and, and she, I'm not suggesting that Palestine she, should be in Jordan. But you arrive at specific, stereotypical conclusion about a population. And you say that these are not encouraged enough, courageous enough. Yes. While Palestinians... Let me, let me ask you a question. 
Okay. You agreed with the historical, I, I am ignorant about the history <coughs> and you know, I found your presentation rich enough. So you agreed with the two corrections made here that led you to your conclusion. And the correction, you said that yes, the whole world, the bottom line, the whole world was against Palestinians. So now, are you willing to revisit your conclusion? And your, if that correction you accept, you, you, you need to acknowledge and uh, draw a different conclusion, revise your conclusion. Are you willing or you or you're not? Uh, my only conclusion is that the Palestinians have a right to a uh, state and that the government of Mr. Netanyahu is not willing to grant it. That's my only conclusion. But you, In other words, I'm not telling you what I like, I'm telling you this is no, what's going but on. But you, you make a presentation, one hour presentation to drive at that conclusion. And that presentation is faulty, it's not objective. Historically, it's not true. And you admitted that there are several historical facts that you omitted in your presentation based on that acknowledgement. Are you willing to revise your conclusion? No, I'm not going to revise the fact that you so have the right to a Palestinian state. What are we talking about? Yeah, that's what I wonder. You have the right to a Palestinian state and the Israeli government, which is a coalition, does not want to grant it. This is the only conclusion which makes sense. Now, with the backing of the United Nations, we have a new factor. We have the fact that time is changing. It's a bit late to play uh, annexionism de facto. It will make the uh, life more difficult for the Israelis. That's it. That's it. For the rest, the British have always played a very uh, uh, ambiguous game, not only against the Arabs. They also squeeze the Jews uh, with, with one of the uh, white, white books. Uh, to, to diminish the number of people who could go in. They were ambiguous. They, they wanted to preserve their own uh, Arab uh, policies. The history is, is complicated. No one is totally right. There are conflicting interests in history. And, and no one will prevail because he is just. No one will prevail because he has the moral grounds only. That's it. Otherwise you go for something else than politics. Yes? So I wonder if I could move the discussion back over to the issue of state building. Uh, with the idea of the two-state solution, um, I'd just like to get a little bit more of a sense from you of how viable you think that is in the long-term possibility. And uh, if not, what are the alternatives? Well, the, the two-state the two states, uh, is certainly more viable than a one-state that some people speak of, you know? There should be only one state with Jews and Arabs. That, that is absolutely non-viable. Uh, the two states, well, it might be viable. Why not? I mean, uh, the, the, the Palestinians will not be isolated from the Arab world. They will communicate with, with, with the rest of the Arab world. They, they, they can survive. Uh, and, uh, and, and the Israelis, uh, they, they feel as connected to the West, and to, especially to the US. That's it. It's, it's not non-viable. No, no, nobody, nobody in Israel ever said that it's absolutely unviable to have a Palestinian state. It is. It might be viable. The first thing to see if it's viable is to try to, to, to try it. Okay, that will be uh, not far from the two last questions. Huh? Okay, the two last. Yes, you first, because you have not spoken yet. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the. Uh, you, you talked about the rise of the uh, Turkey's influence in the region. And uh, I want, uh, you said earlier that uh, previously Turkey was not such a, such a wasn't a, a big favorite during the uh, Ottoman Caliphate, right? Do you see a backlash now that Turkey is? Uh, I mean, of course, Turkey is um, kind of a, you know getting a, a hero's welcome. Everyone's getting a hero's welcome by correctly the, the papers today in Egypt or was it Palestine? But he was getting a he was, he's being welcomed by the uh, for his role in the. In, in, in the Israeli Palestine conflict. Do you see, however, in the long run, that there could be a backlash in a sense uh, that uh, Turkey itself also is, uh, uh, I mean, Erdogan has a, a kind of a double speak, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he's on one hand trying to support the Palestine, Palestinian cause, on the other hand, he's not really, uh, you know, admitting the Armenian genocide or, or the uh, uh, 
the idea of the uh, the Kurdish, uh, you know, uh, re uh, that rebellion. So, could there be in the long run a kind of a backlash against Turkey's rise in the region? In that sense, that's one question. Then the other question is, uh, uh, the, a kind of a we talk about the rise of uh, you know the other nations as well. Do you see that the uh, uh, Israel looking beyond U.S. to create new alliance like uh, what? Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Okay. Navi was, uh, no, I'm also being uh, swept away by Maybe the Lala. notion that uh, is in this, uh, but Maybe I try to answer it. Yeah, yeah. 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 in that sense, are they looking oh, okay. east? Are they looking east? I mean, with other countries that has veto power, like China maybe, or Russia. Look, first of all, Turkey is not going to make war for Palestinians. To them, it's a good way, politically, to make propaganda. They want to be the number one in the Muslim world, so you've got to say things which are detrimental to the Israelis and which are good for the Palestinian nation. Okay. But they will not go to war against Israel. They want to be more powerful. They are not going to lose their power in a, in a war that they are not sure to win. B, as far as Israel is concerned, uh, what, what other alliance can they make? Who's going to support Israel, uh, apart from the U.S. 100%? The Chinese, they're not stupid. The Chinese are not stupid. They're not going to support Israel. They don't want to lose uh, all the support they've got uh, in, in the, what was called the third world. They, there is no other possible alliance for the Israelis than the alliance with the U.S preferably the Republicans. So in this sense, if the U.S. does, uh, in the long run, go, go down the, the chains of history, then that would mean the fall of the Israel uh, state as well? On the long run, it's a danger. If you if you protect her and you have only one gets weaker, you are weakened also. But I mean, that, that's a slow process. No, no, nobody... Uh, will lose uh, its sleep because of that in the next 10 years. Yes, sir. But also, I think in the very long run, however long that is, maybe not in my lifetime, but in the lifetime of many of the people in this room, that the US will perhaps ultimately realize that the gain of supporting Israel, not supporting Israel generally, but supporting Israel, whatever ridiculous, stupid, cruel, willful, idiotic things right. the Israelis do will have to come to an end. And that some American administration, and I had hoped uh, that Mr. Obama <laughs> and Rashid Khalidi between them might be able to do this, but clearly not this time around, would be able to say to the Israelis, this is enough. I mean, we're going to support you, but we can't, we can't support you to the utter detriment of our own foreign policy. Well, Mrs. Tsipi Rivni, for instance, did admit, just after the elections, which incidentally she had won, she was ahead of Mr. Netanyahu, she said, I, I'm for a Palestinian state because I think that on the long run this is good also for Israel. Okay, I think that in the US also you might have some changes. Some people will realize that why antagonize most of the world just to please not Israel as such, but, but a coalition of yeah. guys who are for annexation. Last question, that's you. Okay. After that, we stop. Um, well, to kind of get back to the um, issue that's been so volatile, if not even explosive in this room, I mean, assuming that the, uh, the Palestinian, the plight of the Palestinian refugees is in some respects the crux of the conflict, in addition to the issue of borders, you have this very um, stark notion of power politics, you know, almost conscious of notions of Thucydides, the strong do as they will, the weak do as they must. You know, and I think you do kind of tend to wear that realist hat, which is, of course, pitted against notions of morality and justice and ethics and so forth. But it doesn't seem like there necessarily ought to be as sharp of a dichotomy. So when it comes to the refugee issue, for instance, isn't there some kind of happy medium? Isn't there some sort of what many people would regard as a just and equitable solution to the refugee problem that reflects 
in some ways, the, the political realities on the ground and the fact that Israel is the most powerful by far, but one which at least some modicum of Palestinians' demands for justice based on UN Resolution 194, if not the letter of the accord, at least the spirit. What? First of all, you know what's demography? Yes. What happened to demography in this century? We tripled. We are four times more. A hundred years ago, we were 1.6. We are reaching 7 million. So those 700 refugees, 700,000 refugees, how many are they now? The three million and a half. And so you're going to put three million and a half in that tiny piece of territory, which I said is 5,500 5, 5,500 square kilometers. It's impossible. What the lady raised that it is just to bring back the refugees means for the Israeli that there is no possible discussion. If you're going to put the problem of the refugees, you want the death of Israel. Why should an Israeli agree with the death of his own state? But what about some kind of combination of uh, repatriation and compensation? Okay, you can symbolically a few just to show that symbolically you agree that they might go back to IFA, etc. But you will not solve it. I started this lecture saying that there is no just solution. There is no just solution. No solution will please the both sides. That's it. But um, Israel also has a right of return idea, right? In the nature of the Jewish states. I don't understand the question. So if you talk about, you know, the okay. Palestinian... May, may I suggest that we continue our okay. discussion over uh, uh, refreshments and yeah, that, you, that, you you direct, that you remember the <laughs> one that said all of the outrageous things. And treat him with the, the warmth uh, uh, and hospitality that we extend to everybody except ourselves. <laughs>